and I am one of the. Oh, that was sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Start again. So, um, yes, for those that don't know me, I am Debs Henry Pollard and I'm one of the trustees of Art Can. Um, for those of you who don't know um, what Art Can is, it's a wonderful organisation which is volunteer and artist led, which supports artists through exhibitions, opportunities, um, peer to peer development, networking. And it's one of the most amazingly um, generous and supportive spaces particularly art spaces that I've ever come across and it's brilliant to be part of it um, and we have wonderful exhibitions like this and in real life um, with all the work is for sale um, I thought I'd put that in right at the beginning and all the proceeds from the sales go directly to the artists themselves we don't take any of the any commission at all um, and we're supported by generous um, founder friends and friends um, and also, you know, we, we do get um, small amounts of money from um, corporations, which is brilliant. Um, you can find out more. I'll put a link in the chat box to the website, to the friends page, just by chance. Um, so that if anyone wants to support us through joining as a friend, um, it would be wonderful to have you on board. Um, but for this evening, I'm very happy to welcome you to the virtual space. And thank you all for being here and for supporting us. I'm only going to speak very briefly. Um, during this week of COP22, it's excellent to see Art Can leading from the front and using art to open up vital discussions around the important and urgent topic of climate change. And for that, we must thank our three excellent curators, all of the Art Can artists, Catherine Fenton, Hannah Pratt, and Lawrence Mathias. Um, they are all highlighting issues that, yes, make us uncomfortable, but could also offer a creative vision of a future yet to come. We cannot ignore the effects of climate change. And through art, we can develop conversations around our own responsibilities and actions. As well as the wonderful curators, our thanks must also go to Tom Dale of TD360. Um, Tom and I were introduced to each other via LinkedIn in January 2021 to talk about presenting art virtually, and I suggested that he talk with Kate, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, the original virtual gallery which he created for us was, I think, one of the best to be found online. And having had a sneak peek earlier today, I can say that for this exhibition, he's worked very closely with the curators and together they have created an amazingly sympathetic environment, which is a work of art in itself and really sets the pieces off beautifully. So huge thanks to Tom, the curators, the artists, everyone involved, for all of you for supporting us. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to the curators for the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna make sure that I've... Uh going to find my um this is where I made the mistake of somebody there we go where is it art can virtual gallery I'm going to share this now can you see it not yet ah not yet, there we go same. now oh oh it's coming yeah <laughs> everyone there see it go. yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Well, before we take you round, I'm going to first of all head back out the door. Outside, give you a quick whiz round. We'll come back to that in, in, in a moment in Hannah's capable hands. But first of all, I just wanted to give you a little bit of um, a little bit of an idea of how we came to this point. So first of all, welcome to Breathing Out and Art Can Climate Change Exhibition. So Breathing Out came from the idea that we've all been holding our breath for quite a long time, waiting to see what will happen as climate change gets worse and worse, and we start to see more and more effects of the impacts, uh, the effects, the impact, the um, fear, and some of the, I think probably a lot of news that can make us feel really stressed and worried about it. But we didn't want to just focus on that. We wanted to think about something that we could do as well. So when Hannah Pratt, Lawrence Mathias and I, we've been working on this concept of breathing out 
for about a year, sharing information on the negative effects of climate change, small community-led projects and new technology. They say that technology of the next 10 years will move at a faster rate than it has since the Industrial Revolution, as people try to find ways to deal with the ever-changing circumstances around us. We wanted Breathing Out to, be a, to give a voice to artists so that they could respond in their own way to climate change. But we also wanted to look at an, at an optimism that we felt was also there when we looked at all the research we did around small community projects and um, technology changing, people desperately trying to do something. So from that point of view, we had the wonderful Tom Dale who created the virtual gallery exactly as we envisaged it. A space that was clean, modern, yet had allowed nature to have an equal share of the space. Uh, we, the name Breathing Out, like we said, came from that idea of holding on to our breath and taking a deep breath and, and moving forward. And for that reason, we wanted this exhibition to not just be about the artwork. And we've created two more dates this month with speakers. So on the 22nd of November, we will be having Stella Yarrow, who is a climate activist, campaigner and an artist, and was one of the earliest uh, members of the Extinction Rebellion. She will be talking about environmental politics and how to promote green issues. Um, on that same day, we will be having Leonardo Reyes Acosta, who is an ecologist and eco-hydrologist. Just sit down, but we can't get that right now. And he will be explaining the meaning behind the stats of all those um, stripes and things you see on posters of um, seas warming. We may not all understand it. And a lot of the other statistics we hear um, being talked about at COP27. So he's gonna make it easier for us to understand. On the uh, 29th, we will have uh, Tao uh, Paul Wimbush. He's the founder of a pioneering West Wales eco-village, Lammas, which is a self-sustaining off-grid new settlement initiated in 2008. A collection of small holding, its members generate enough surplus food to sell back to the local community and run a number of small businesses connected to sustainable lifestyles. He, Tao will be explaining the workings and benefits of the project. Um, on that day, we will also have Jordan McCulloch, who is a senior HR business partner at Irish Water and uh, heads up the sustainability team. He will be talking about safeguarding uh, water futures for all. Joseph Keppen is an entrepreneurial creator, developer and strategist, and will be talking about how technology changes our climate. And I fear, I, is Simon Joshua Lawrence on also on the 29th or on the 22nd? Uh, 29th. Okay, so we'll have four speakers on the 29th. So Simon Joshua is the founder member of the local environmental group, Harrow Biodiversity, a London Green Parks ranger and a coordinator for a large London food provision charity and an enthusiastic allotment holder and gardener. Uh, he lectures on soil improvement and the dangers of soil degradation in the developed and developing world. We will be sending uh, uh, a list of these uh, speakers along with the Eventbrite li uh, links to anyone who's interested or to all the people who have uh, joined us here tonight, if you'd like to. Okay, so from that point of view, I am going to hand over to Hannah for a moment as we start. Should we start outside? We're gonna start with the sculpture. Sorry, I gotta go that's back. That's all right, let's, let's go again. outside. I think let's go outside. We'll start and, uh, back start outside. From, start from nature. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, let me get rid of that. There we go. There we go. All right. So at the moment, we are facing um, Melly Jordan's piece, which is called Conquer. Which is a beautiful little piece. We've enlarged it a little bit in the gallery, so it's easier to see. Um, but we all love this piece. It's just like a little beautiful little um, representation of uh, nature and how nature changes and forms, etc. Um, do you want to spin around, Catherine? You want to get back in your seat? <laughs> Sorry, I all of a sudden realised my battery was dying. I thought right. that would be really, really quite bad. Oh no, that's awesome. Okay, oh, so then next here, uh, we've got. Did you get my list? Airplanes by Sabatier Mascapan, which is amazing. I, I love, I, I, I we originally chose this piece because, um, well, it, it reminded me of 
um, kind of post-apocalyptic um, living after the end of the world, possibly, which seems a bit um, morbid, but it was uh, it just it just really fitted in. They just really fitted into uh, the the theme and um, sort of a portent of things that we can that we can prevent, which is kind of the ethos of the exhibition as well. And here we've got a work by Stathis, and that is um, it's a ceramic piece, which again we've had to um, sort of make larger slightly, so it's got a little bit more impact on the screen. Um, and we loved these because it they sort of reminded us of little 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 creatures um, that might emerge from the aftermath of uh, of climate change. Um, we just love them; they're beautiful, and we love the colour. And um, yeah, we we're so super happy that we could have this in the exhibition. Sorry, I just remembered that the you can see it much better if I do this. Yeah. Sorry. And there we go. It's another piece, um, another piece from the same artist. Um, and it looks like it's from like found objects from the end of the world. So um, again, we love that. We love that too. And we wanted to put some sculptures on the outside um, because we wanted the exhibition to really engage. Sorry, can I just straight away with for a moment there, Hannah? Yeah, sure. Can I ask everybody else to mute themselves apart from? Hannah, um, Lawrence and I for the moment, because I can hear a lot of crackly stuff going on in the background. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we, shall we dive in the space, Catherine? Let's dive in the space. <laughs> so as you can see, it's a gorgeous space. Thank you once again, Tom, for making this such an amazing environment. So Hannah, um, shall we carry on with the sculptures here? Well, we could do like, um, Lawrence could explain a little bit about the space because yes. it was um, uh, Lawrence's beautiful drawings that uh, really inspired Tom to bring the space to life. Uh, yeah, that, that, no, no problem. Um, yeah, when well, we talked about it, we wanted um, an open space, uh, very much an open field of nature, um, kind of very much occupying it, inhabiting it. Um, so we had the idea of these kind of walls of vines, uh, tree forms and platforms, and we kind of simplified it, and distilled it down to a uh, simple colonnaded kind of interior with the balconies, everything stripped down and minimalist, but with this lovely kind of um, verdure, the, the green, the grass, uh, and the interesting sculptural tree forms, which, which came um, kind of partly supporting, partly decorative, but um, all the, uh, it's Tom's touch, which has really finessed it at the end and everything. Uh, but yeah, it, it worked uh, very, very well. We were really delighted. He put a lot of really hard work into it. So it, it showed, I think. Right, well, I'm going to take you back downstairs. Now you had a little hint of excitement to follow. So should we go back to, to one of the, this one um, is one of our, our hidden gems. I'm going to head over here. Sorry, somebody still has their um, radio on or something in the background there. Hello, somebody, uh, could somebody, I don't know if I can mute everyone else, can I? I think you can. Try and work out how to do it, oh, it's complicated. In the meantime, Hannah, do you want to take that, talk about this one? Yeah, of course. So um, this lovely piece is by um, Mandy Dillon. And uh, we thought the form and the size was a beautiful addition to the show. Um, and it reminded, it, it just, we thought it fitted in with the theme of the show beautifully. Um, as it's, as it kind of it looks like an air particle and atoms and, and uh, sort of, it's just a beautiful piece and we were all very taken with it. Um, I'd love to see it. I would love to see it like installed. It would be beautiful. And we decided to uh, give it its own little space to, um, to sort of break up the gallery space as well, because it's quite a large uh, sort of space. So yeah, we gave it its little, its little, uh, little space to get well, the most out. I'm just checking to see if the who's not muted because I'm still hearing <laughs> that background noise. But, uh, okay. So I kind of cut you out of the space there. Sorry, I realise this is being recorded. And I've lost your lovely uh, face. There we go. Sorry, Hannah. No, 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 don't worry. Don't worry. It's absolutely fine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's all I really wanted to say about it. Um, I can't speak as much as I would like to about all the pieces. Otherwise, we'll be here till midnight. <laughs> so maybe we should just keep going. <laughs> so what we will do is just, especially, we wanted to give a special time, really, to the sculpture, because um, very often we don't get a chance 
to um to talk about them as much as the paintings. Ah, what's happening? Stop. There we go. So we've got this one here, which is lovely too. Look at this one. Who was this one, Hannah? This is Lucy Chapman. Um, and this is a beautiful resin piece uh, with, I believe, seeds that are in the middle of, um, in the middle of sort of germ germinating. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's a, yeah, it, it's very beautiful. Um, and I think it ties in quite nicely with a lot of the themes that we've been discussing, actually, uh, particularly with your work as well, Lawrence with Lamas and, and how yes. we need to nurture nature and respect it as well. Um, yeah, it's a great addition. Um, it's, yeah, it's very subtle, but very powerful at the same time. Thank you. Any, uh, Lawrence, anything you want to particularly highlight? The all the um, pieces are lovely, so it's quite yeah. tricky. <laughs> yeah, um, well, if, if uh, perhaps I could quickly whisk through um, some of the aspects of downstairs mm -hmm. purely because I'm um, I'm let's start the... with some of yours because not everybody's are uh, politically um, motivated such as yours are sure yeah um, well I, I, a lot of my output is often uh, satirical and political I'm, I'm just addicted to doodling and cartoons so uh, rolling out the barrels it's the oil interest which is uh, drowning protest as best it can so it's a bunch of uh, oil executives pouring out the uh, the oil on all the little protesters and drowning them. So uh, just a simple little comment, really. It's it's pertinent, I think. Um, and I've I've done a number of these um, uh, studies. Um, next one is um, um, music for the maestro, uh, devil fiddles, as it were, when the world burns. This is feeding the land, a little bit um, heavy on the sardonicism kind of thing, but. Um, the agro-petrochemical industry, really, and how fertilizers, pesticides, uh, all oil byproducts, a lot of them end up really being reconstituted as so-called nutriment for the land. Uh, in fact, contribution to contributing in in no small measure, I think, to the soil quality deteriorating. And also, there's a there's a farmer tipping bars of oil, crude oil, on the on, on the land. Simplification, but it's again political. Um, and I've, I've done uh, several of these, really, um, a similar theme, um, and uh, it's there for anyone to, to explore. But I've, most pertinently, really, it's um, if, if you click on the information, there's a video. Um, this one? Uh, it's just that one, yeah. Uh, and it should be um, a video. And that's um, a Lamas triptych. Uh, and there I am with my little guitar. <laughs> but uh, I, went, uh, I went to Lamas um three different weekends and i recorded and the chap who's sitting with the banjo is quite a remarkable chap he's tao wimbush and he's one of the founders of the eco settlement and very generously shared his time and talked a lot about what was going on and took me around the small holdings and demonstrated it, it, the work he does um he's built a lot of remarkable buildings as have all the people there um and they're they're farming entirely self-sustainably organically um, and they're putting so much back into the soil. It was bare, degraded upland, West Wales far, uh, farm. It was a sheep run for 30 years or so. The soil was really poor. Uh, I think it would have been classed as dead soil virtually. Uh, the, the organic con content was so poor. Um, anyway, they remulched it, uh, refertilized the land, and now they've got a, a wonderful set of small holdings. It's like a little Eden, uh, rich in wildlife. Um, absolutely rich in crops. They're growing things they never expected to grow in a hilly West Wales, windy, cold West Wales farm. They're growing stuff like pumpkins, okra, um, uh, uh, orchards, blueberries. It's quite extraordinary. So anyway, that's that's a long, longish video. And I, I think so, if anyone wants to come back to that, that would be lovely. Yeah. Um, I think we've got. I'm just off the top of my head. I know that we've got Cat Coulter here. And her work is particularly strong um, in the environment. Kat, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Lovely. I'm gonna I'm gonna whiz straight ahead to yours because I saw your name there and I find your work very powerful on the theme. So oh, thank you. would you like to like to say a little bit about this piece? Well, this piece in particular, it's it features an awful lot of waste plastics, which is one of my 
create bugbears because plastic is pretty much um, totally derived from oil and you know, uh, every stage of production of plastics, a lot of which are just completely unnecessary. They're throwaway single use items and they're derived from fossil fuels. Uh, and we all know we want to get away from fossil fuels. It's producing stuff which we really don't need. Uh, so to me, your single use plastic bottles, plastic spoons, and you know, there's netting there, which why do we need to have fruit and vegetables sold to us in plastic nets? Uh, it drives me nuts. Um, so this- uh, Pat, used... you haven't told the super wonderful way you make these works. Ah, though. yes. Well, this is, you You, you make these with, uh, this, this. it's a cyanotype photogram. So all of these objects um, have been salvaged and are placed upon uh, my, uh, my surface is you prepare it to make cyanotypes, which I could be here all night explaining those, but it, uh, it's basically, um, a photographic, a, an old fashioned photographic process where you make your surface, um, photosensitive, uh, and then you expose it to UV light. So I find all this rubbish, I clean it up and I put it out on my prepared surface in lovely sunshine and it makes beautiful blueprints for me. This is another one of cats. So I'm just going past cats These, once because they're um, they're really beautiful, really beautiful. Oh, if you, you want to come back and hear but more about it, I particularly the, like the stuff this one. From really Sorry, is beautiful. I'm getting I'm getting no, the, out of, I'm getting, stuff getting lost really trying to find this middle one. There it is. There it is. Because the thing that's amazing about this one for me hmm. is it almost looks like a jellyfish. Uh, lots of people see different things. As I, I see a planet on blue fire. I mean, okay. it, you can see you can Fair see enough. so many things about it. it that is that's a that is uh, what you call ghost gear. It's part of a um, an abandoned, well, lost uh, lobster pot, um, which I dragged off the beach and cleaned up and um, turned into this. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Mm. It's uh, it's great. I mean, one thing that's positive is that a lot of the um, uh, throwaway plastics are now being changed to uh, cornstarch. Um, they're using algae for single use items. So hopefully very, very soon. The new directive as well is that um, most things have to have um, from I think it's 2025, have to have 70% recycled plastic in them. So there's a real push for plastics to be recycled. So um, that's great. Yeah, we still need to not produce them in the first place. The recycling only goes so far. Well, it's, there's uh, um, can, yeah. so there's the the so there's some things that also plastics are useful for, such as wind turbines and solar panels have a high content of plastic in them because it's what makes it durable. So once again, it's a bit like money. It depends on what we use it for. And we have to definitely get away from the uh, single use, mm -hmm. the throwaway society, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of things that we use, like children's toys that break in two minutes and that have traveled all across the ocean to be delivered for a party bag. Those are, those are my bug bear cat. <laughs> <laughs> those little those little things that bring no joy and yet seem to have taken yeah, yeah. so many hands to make and break in no time at all um so uh do we have who is this one by again sorry i should remember i should remember um but i do love this one as well because this one is is heady um and this were things that she picked up off the thames the thames yeah. beach mm -hmm which, um, like I said, is a wonderful piece. Yeah, put, put them all in colour order, which I very much appreciate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Are you here, Hedy? <laughs> while I was at it. You're here, Hedy. Mm. Give us a little bit of a talk about it. Well, I, I love the, um, the Thames um, foreshore at low tide. And so I go there quite a lot and I was cleaning the beach a little bit and just thought that um, I could incorporate it in the piece. And it's it's interesting in so many levels because you could see the the shards of um, clay pipes that um, <clears throat> you know that there's so many of them discarded on on the beach there by the Thames uh, by the Millennium Bridge, 
and um and and these sort of like eventually they're, they're almost made like the sand you know but the plastics will never ever you know sort of go back into into the earth sort of materials that you just so heady for people who don't know who aren't english the uh clay pipes a little bit at the bottom were victorian um clay pipes that people would smoke out of and smoke, then throw yeah. them in the same way that we would have um filters from cigarettes abandoned everywhere wow. this was the victorian equivalent yeah that's right but the, but and um you know and then and then the um um the, the the word the sort of the the title low tide also made me think about you know where where is going to be low tide when sea levels rise and the Thames uh, level is, is going to rise so um so so uh, different you know ways different uh, subjects and issues to to think about um but uh, just making um something that is you know be, you know hopefully beautiful to see but about something that is is very dark and and, and very very upsetting so it's uh it's a kind of multi-layered collage Thank you, Hedy. That's great. Let's have a little thing. Anyone, um, any particular one that anyone who's here that wants to talk about their work? Otherwise, it'll be me. It is, it <laughs> is Sylvia. Silpa. It, it, Silpa. Oh, I know. Hang on a minute. Barry. I know Jenny. I know. Um, Jenny, you're here, aren't you? Uh, so, so, Sylvie? Right. This is um, Jen's. Hi. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm here. And Hamish. Where are you? <laughs> I'm trying to find you. Have you got your... Um, uh, yeah, got the camera I'm trying on. to Wait. find you. I'm trying to find you. There you are. And Hamish. Hi, Hamish. Hi there. Hi, everyone. These morning. guys are coming in from New Zealand. Yes, I morning. I was going to say very good morning. <laughs> good morning. Well, morning, Atamara, okay. as you say it here. <laughs> So um, this piece of this piece of work is actually um, inspired by the south coast of the North Island um, of New Zealand, which is not this particular part of the coast, but Hamish is originally from the, the southern part of the North Island of New Zealand, which is Wellington. And while we have the South Island and the North Island, when you are in Wellington, when you're on the south coast of the North Island, there is nothing really between you and Antarctica except the great southern oceans. So this particular piece of land and where this is inspired from, and it's from a, um, one of our uh, holidays, it's, it's a place that you go to that is very, uh, very raw with the elements. And while there is a small uh, settlement of houses nearby, people really, it's not a part of, of the coast you could ever really tame. And that is very typical of um, this part of, of New Zealand. The, when the weather comes in from the Southern Seas, it is a little bit like the Northern Seas weather coming into um, the UK and into Europe. It's, it's driven from a, a very cold part of the world, the Antarctica, which is one of the places that we are, of course, watching very closely where there's a lot of research. Um, and this is where it comes in and the, the, the strength of the undertow here, the power of the weather, the standing on this, these black sand, sand beach in a very raw environment. Um, this is where this is, this is inspired by. And it also, um, part of why I, I chose the piece is that it is an area where it's the kind of place where we try and leave our mark as, as humans and actually we don't get to because it is such a powerful part of nature and such a powerful place. But it's also where climate change will uh, very much be foul. Our coastal communities, like it is in, in the UK and, and other places around the world who have very uh, high density of coastal communities, climate change is, is very strongly going to impact our, our coastal communities. And we're already being faced with the challenges here and much discussion about what to do in terms of manage retreat and what that will look like because New Zealand has a very strong coastal community uh, lifestyle and uh, history, and, and this goes back uh, hundreds of years. So it all came together as, as being a, a place that I really wanted to represent through my work. Thanks, Jen. Okay. 
Um, who have we got next? Anyone here that particularly like to talk about their work that's um, on board? Okay, I'm gonna head. Uh, I, I think, um, <laughs> oh, Lawrence, we can barely hear you. Barry, down, who, who, downstairs who, who? with the Amazon. Ah, okay, is Sylvie oh, here? Two, two, two rounds, yes, please. I'm here. <laughs> there you I'm go. Here. Yes. Well, this is one of my paintings. My, my signal isn't too great at the moment. I'll try and move somewhere else. <laughs> no problem. I'm trying to find Sylvie. Where are you? There I'm, you go. Uh, well, I can just um, say that uh, I have a series of four paintings speaking about the Amazon region. This one is an indigenous reserve, a national park, and two other kind. This one is a national park and uh, two other kind of uh, uh, protected areas. I wanted to illustrate here four kind of um, protected areas who plays a very big role in protection of the biodiversity and the uh, climate change. This one is another one, which is called Quilombola, oh, territory of Quilombola which is a kind of reserve for uh, descendants of um, slaves, African slaves in Brazil. And the other one on the right is uh, Preserva Extrativista, which is another kind of reserve where uh, people were ex uh, exploring the rubber, rubber tree. And uh, well, with these four examples, I wanted to show that uh, this kind of environment can play a very big role in, um, in protecting the, the environment and, uh, and the role of the people are playing with the, the conservation of uh, nature and the mitigation of climate change. I have been working as a researcher in Amazonia a long time before to now um, doing art with my research. And are you still, do you still have connections there, Sylvie? I have still connection with people, yes. This particular painting was made for um, illustrating, uh, for, il uh, Sorry for my English. Uh, in order to illustrate a work of an uh, NGO in Brazil. Um, so I have connection with people working in Brazil and I'm still, uh, and I still do uh, some illustration for their work in order to. Uh, Sorry, I was just checking to see if there was someone, another artist that wanted to talk. They're really, really beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous. I'm just going to take everyone to the other one that you did so we can have a feel of the four of them together. I can't quite get back to give the impact of the four. I can get back a little, um, but the four of them together is really quite gorgeous. Um, see, how could I get there? I could go this way. I go that way and then I could turn around. I think. Am I going the right way, Hannah? No, I'm not, I can't sure, I'm not it sure the gallery's designed to do that, but you know. Oh, uh, well, it looks useful. never mind. It looks it's gorgeous anyway. the way it is. <laughs> right. Is, um, out of curiosity, is uh, Kat Felice, Felice here on the call? I can't remember. Are you here? Uh, if not, I'm I'm super happy to talk about um to talk about Kat, right. Catherine's piece because uh, we've actually got two pieces down here from her, um one of two uh, D and one three D. Got three pieces down here. Um, if you could got turn three around, there we go. Down here. So this is a beautiful found uh, wooden sculptural piece uh, that we all we all loved. Um, just the, uh, it, it was it was nice because uh, this was one of the, there was a couple of uh, found uh, objects, pieces of work that just fitted in perfectly in the space, including Jenny's. 
Um, and it's just the, um, with the sort of this and the columns, um, it just looks fabulous in the space. And coupled with uh, the beautiful 2D work that uh, Catherine submitted, um, which reminded us of sort of oil kind of seeping through the ground and, and, uh, and et cetera. It's, uh, it's the two beautiful pieces that go together. So yeah, very happy to have them in the show. One thing we found that was very interesting is the way that people dealt with things on a very, very different level. Some people uh, went for a kind of an almost angry response um, and other people went back to, I think what was almost like a gentle view of what nature was. We really wanted this piece to be at the top of the stairs because we thought it was really impactful. It's, um, it's a sort of a coral effect made from uh, wool fibers and, um, what was it made of? Well, let me see. It was made of. Uh, it's a multi sort of textile piece, embroidery. Uh, really, it's by uh, it's by Sylvia Malen. It's uh, beautiful. Um, it's it's just such a multi layered piece. It's it's lovely, and, and it looks so a... it looks so natural, which is what's so incredible about it. It's, yeah. it's hard to believe that this is made out of bits of wool and um, fiber. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, lovely piece. And if it, we'd also really like this one because it was kind of very different from every everything else. Do we have um, the... this is this is Lisa's. Um, she's a fellow space artist like me. <laughs> so uh, this piece is um, actually uh, in space right now. It's in it's floating above our heads in the uh, in the um, uh, the space station. Um, going around our heads uh, and it's actually a very special piece because it's uh it's part of the first ever gallery in space um a little a little box of beautiful tiny pieces uh were sent up to the space station um as very special um and i think they have plans to continue doing this with successive launches um but can for me, this piece that, is can very... Can you explain the idea behind that, Hannah? So they were sending up uh, pieces to the space station? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To what, to sort um, of create a more sympathetic space there? Or what is the idea? So basically the idea is that the, there hasn't really been any art in space. Um, and art is a beautiful way to explore different environments and make sure that... Um, it's just to make sure that there is an artistic sort of representation in space, which can be quite a scientific, clinical, uh, sort of barrenish environment. Um, so the idea to get art up there is, you know, to entertain entertain the astronauts too, who who are quite often do do a lot of like creative practice with photography and stuff like that. But it's just like didn't a different you get, way. Didn't you get a piece of yours, a piece of yours projected onto a rocket? Uh, no, no, I, I've got, I've got piece, a, a piece that was laser etched onto uh, a satellite, which is whizzing above our heads as we speak. <laughs> it's very cool, very yeah. cool. But uh, Lisa and I are going to do a little chat about art in space and how it links to climate change later Fantastic. on. The run. That, that'll be fun. Uh, where should we go next, Hannah? Gorgeous oh, it's space. Completely up to you, Catherine. Right, uh, then I I'm going to take Hannah. Sue is here, Catherine. Sue Ransley, I think. Um, she she offered to talk about. Did her you, painting. Sue? Where are where are you? Where's Sue? Put me in the right yeah. direction. I'm here. Yes, no, I'm in the right direction to your painting. Was it upstairs? Um, it was downstairs near the entrance, I think. On the right. This one. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, um. This didn't actually start out as anything to do with climate change. It's really a nod to my mother. Um, who, from when I was really tiny, would, at the moment she was outdoors, she'd stick her face to the sun, close her eyes and breathe in deeply. And uh, I can remember even from when I was like four or five, she'd grab my hand and say, breathe in the prana, darling, breathe in the prana. Um, and I understand prana in uh, many Eastern cultures is the essence of life. And she felt really strongly that we should, you know, absorb as much goodness from the air as we can. And then 
breathing out lets go of all the toxins and whilst as I say it wasn't painted as a as a climate change thing it's a nod to my mum it's suddenly become very pertinent because the air that we breathe is potentially no longer that um, good for us uh, certainly if we live in in the cities or near industry so um, hence I submitted it and was delighted to be part of the show thank you fantastic yeah this piece is very pertinent for me as well because um where i live in london um i live in southeast london and unfortunately one of the first uh sort of recorded deaths of uh pollution um was actually just down the road from me um so this was uh this was i saw this and thought it also relates to my own health as well like i've been struggling with long covid and pollution really does affect how i breathe yeah. So I saw this and it was like, got to have that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, a friend, um, uh, Jasmine Pradesito, is um, involved in raising funds for um, clean air projects. She, uh, she was commissioned. It might be the, the death you're talking about, the little girl who, who died. Uh, the little girl's mother is campaigning and um, Jasmine Pradesito is working with her um, and mm. is creating sculptures using um, a substance because she was a scientist first. She's invented a substance that called NOx that absorbs the um, noxious uh, and dangerous chemicals from the air that we breathe. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredibly upsetting and sad story, but it's um, the only thing you can sort of hope is that it, it changes policy and mm. enables a change um, within society, which shouldn't really have happened. So, yep. or shouldn't have well, happened at all. With so. the, with the um, electric vehicles, that hopefully things will improve. Obviously, with electric vehicles, we need that need the electricity to be green itself. So it's yep. an ongoing an ongoing process but there are a lot of plans mm. for um electricity to be made from solar panels now but also ongoing in the future and so hopefully we'll get to a stage where um where it's better though interestingly enough i was talking to to a couple of people and one of the comments um over the discussion on the weekend was the only way to be 100 percent sustainable is to stand still because every action we do, everything we do has an impact of, of, of some sort. So um, even making solar panels, the process of making them is actually very polluting and, and complex. And so too with, um, you know, with, with uh, wind turbines and, you know, so, so, we're always, so we're always kind of playing catch up with the things we've already done and trying to find a way of, mitigating some of our actions moving forward but it is difficult isn't it because we can't it, it's very difficult to go backwards and so we do you know that Lawrence Hannah and I have spoken about this a lot that we do feel at least that there is a real um, uh, movement of like-minded people very clever people much more clever than me that can find that that are looking at ways of trying to deal with these problems as best as we can in the process of finding a different way of, of living. One of the things we 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 really felt was that this is a time where we need to reimagine who we are. We've spent so long chasing constant growth that we've forgotten what we're growing for. It so I, I believe at times we don't know what purposes we're chasing all the time for more without ever realizing whether we have enough and um, I think this I think COVID actually in the lockdown gave us a moment to actually stand still and uh, question how much of everything we need yeah, how yeah. much of everything do we need to do you're going to say something Lawrence I thought I heard Lawrence ch chiming in, so I'd stop for a second. Um, who else would we yeah, like um, to, to um, visit? I was, uh, yeah, just mentioning. Uh, Lawrence, come back to us. All is forgiven. There he yeah. is. Yeah, um, am I dipping out? A little bit. Oh, 
I think Sandy Sandy Layton would um, like to talk too. Uh, Sandy Layton, Catherine. Okay, where's Sandy? Do you remember? So uh, Sandy Layton is just downstairs. She's one downstairs. of the uh, a group of three sculptures that's on the ball, uh, on one of the boulders by the stairs. No, no, sorry, beg your pardon. By the entrance. There we go. There we go. Sandy, you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Hi, Sandy. Hello. I just like to have a word about this sculpture, which I made um, to do with refugees, and because partly because we have a Ukrainian mother and daughter living with us. And um, the forms I and I was thinking of the refugee crisis or the migration of people because of climate change is, I mean, it's forecast to have millions and billions or whatever of people coming, well, coming to, to the West from um, under, you know, because of climate change. Sorry, um, Sandy, do you have your camera on? I was trying yes. to find you. Yeah, I've got ah. my camera on. Yeah. Where are you? Yeah, my camera is on, yeah. Um, yes, my camera's on. There you are, gotcha. There you are. And um, I was just, uh, the shapes and forms, these two forms are the curved form in, in, um, in the south of France. And um, the reason I chose that is because I have a, a grandmother who was Basque French. And this is obviously a refuge from the elements if you walk in the mountains. The other form, the sort of, um, the other form is actually an artist who created um, a bothy in Scotland for artists to visit, who wanted to do sort of residencies or just to escape into the beauty of the highlands really. And they're very basic. They don't have, um, they don't have toilets or anything like that. They have a heater, some log fires and, um, lighting. And so both of these are kind of refugee, refuge, a refuge from elements and a refuge from, in both cases, a refuge from the elements, really. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to say uh, it also links to climate change mm. um, and also the wish to go to beautiful places in the highlands and of Scotland, um, away from the polluted cities like London. And the refuge in the mountains is similar for that reason. So that's why I put that piece in. The other pieces are relating more to, um, I, yes, the other pieces, this one is, is to do with, um, more to do with decay. They're all ceramic, by the way. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, and uh, I was thinking of pollution and decay in this one. And the last one is about, um, is my, my looking at the surfaces of this, this one was me looking at these surfaces, which are designed to make them look, um, well, I suppose more uh, clay. I mean, I think also something about clay coming from the earth, coming from the ground, it's a natural, natural uh, material, but also the edges are sort of looking at, um, I felt decaying or erosion, really erosion. Um, and, yeah, that, these were, I thought, linked to, all of my pieces linked to climate change in some way or other. Thank you, Sandy. Very much. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, Hannah, would you like to talk about your piece? Yeah, sure, go for it. I think I'm upstairs. You're upstairs, next to Uta, yeah. I believe. No, I think I'm uh, next to Kat, actually, at the end. Oh, yeah. There we go. You're going to have to talk about yours afterwards. I know, but I've got two. <laughs> we'll choose which one we think is most relevant. Okay, so um, this piece is called Great Ambition Chad, um, which is part of a quite a large series of work uh, and a quite a large project that I've been working on for, gosh, maybe 18 months now, uh, in partnership with um, a, a company called Planet. Um, I was one of their... Uh, artist in residence last year um, and they wanted I, I pitched a residency with them which was digital because it was still during lockdown the pandemic uh, sort of early last year um, and which was fine because um, 
all of their all of their resources are online and they are basically um they are the a company with the largest uh collection of geosynchronous um uh so um satellite um imagery uh companies in the world so they work with google they work with nasa uh they work with all these incredible amazing people um and i decided to turn to use all the um, imaging information that they have on on their database which is absolutely vast to have a look at um, a particular project that's very close to my heart in africa which is called the great green wall of africa where um Every, thousands and thousands of people across hundreds of thousands of kilometers are planting trees and vegetation to um, stem the uh, spread of the Sahara Desert, which is slowly, due to climate change, making its way down into areas that were previously have been full of vegetation. Um, but as the years go by and as climate change uh, continues, um, it's creating a lot of hardship for people living in those areas, which again is like something crazy like 6,000 kilometers, hundreds of millions of people, it's, it's, sorry, not hundreds of millions, hundred thousands of people who are being affected through uh, not just like loss of jobs, a loss of population, um, you know, uh, economic migrancy, all that sort of thing. Um, and instead of sort of, um, sort of surrendering to it, they've decided to uh, fight back. And I wanted to, I wanted to see if, if if what their if their community led efforts and grassroots grassroot led efforts are actually making a difference, and it turns out that yes they were that all, all their all their sort of community led efforts to plant trees and vegetation has been working. This is a little so this piece is um, a a data visualization and art piece um, which shows the level of tree growth over four years of data. Uh, looking at a particular area in in Chad, I've done I've done pieces looking at areas in Burkina Faso, in Nigeria, Niger, etc. Um, but this one is is good because I got some really beautiful data from four years worth of looking at trees and and um, etc. Uh, it's quite a simple little visualization. Uh, the orange uh, parts of the of the circle uh, show where there was little or no tree growth and sort of working from the bottom left, the bottom right hand corner round. So where the orange is more prevalent all the way up to where the blue is. So the blue and the darker the blue is a good thing because the darker the blue means there's tree growth where there was no trees before. So as you can see in this area that I was analyzing with the satellite, there's been lots and lots of tree growth and vegetation growth, which means um, wonderful things. People will not be displaced. People will have jobs. People will be able to farm, most importantly, and feed themselves and be self-sufficient, which they should be able to be doing. Um, unfortunately, this area in Africa um, has to deal with some of the most severe um, aspects of climate change. Um, you know, regular temperatures above 50 degrees. It's, it's just awful. So um, I wanted to show something that is has pos positive impact. Um, isn't quite so doomsday tropey as I use that term a lot when I when I, when I talk about climate change, um, and a little bit more positive. Um, and I suppose the 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 aim of this work um, as a whole is to actually put a fire under people, I guess, and 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 just just make them aware that even though. I uh, think, you know, corporations and governments need to change policy and become more aware of the the global issues that their business and capitalism is ultimately affecting. But it's also a piece that just a normal average person like you and me can look at and say, look, I, I can make a difference to my community and I can make a difference to my life and I can improve my life to um, to combat climate change, basically. I won't talk anymore because I could talk forever. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. And very interesting, though, because one of the things we were really keen to uh, focus on was how much small action can make a huge difference. And whether, you know, because I think sometimes people go, oh, it's all going to end. Oh, it doesn't matter. I may as well go shopping. 
And um, well, you really need, you know, which is, you know, quite a natural response. It's the it's the doomsday response, but it's also the easy response. And the better response is actually to uh, recognize that we're all responsible. And even the tiniest thing that we do can make a massive, a massive difference. It's difficult to work out what those small things can be sometimes, because, you know, we may, may think that one thing is really a really positive step and then find out uh, shortly after that that doesn't work. For example, you know, a lot of people are talking about, oh, we, you know, we'll all go to cloth bags but it turns out that the cloth bag in the end is more is more energy intensive and harder to recycle very often than one of those bags for life that keep getting recycled. So then you get confused and you think, well, which which one, which is the best way to go? Because, you know, and then sometimes you have to work out what are your priorities? Are we more worried about the amount of water that's being used in order to grow organic cotton? compared to something that we dislike, which is plastic waste. Um, but then we're, if, we, if we can recycle it and use it more often with less energy, which one's better? And um, very often it's the unattractive and less romantic solutions like garbage collection that are the really important, the, the important issues we need to focus on. But they don't tend to get very many votes because they're not very exciting. Um, you see, I can go on for hours as well. You should, you should have heard Hannah, Lawrence, and I. Every time we got together, we talked for hours about anything. Which one should I go for? New Fukushima or the um, or the new cathedral, Hannah? I, I like the new cathedral. You just sort of buy it. I think it's a lovely thing. Right. So new cathedral. There we go. So the idea around new cathedral is about consumerism. And uh, one of the reasons I uh, painted this was that I was thinking about how our, our landscape changes according to how our society changes. And in um, old landscapes 500 years ago, you very often had a cathedral or church in the distance. But what we, so I wanted the crane to be in a similar position and to have the, the sort of halo of the moon behind it, and making it almost a, a precious, a precious object, because so much of our worship nowadays goes into what we can attain. And um, I wanted the uh, containers to be very beautiful, because um, I I also want stuff. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I also think, oh, is there something lovely in it for me? And it's a really, and, you know, we're bombarded with advertising and it's very easy to believe that the next thing that you get will improve your life um, so much so that it's going to make a massive difference. But very often it doesn't because we, we need to, we need a slightly more soulful solution. However, within this, I wanted it to sort of hark back to um, old paintings. So I've actually craculeured it so it looks older. So I've cracked the varnish over it to make it look like an older painting because I wanted to um, a reference back to days when we thought that the, the, the solution would be abiding by uh, a religious uh, ethos. And we've kind of lost that. Um, in a lot of places and now we're looking for for something else but because there isn't a top-down law in quite the same way we're we're having to consider where we go next much more on our own it can feel a bit daunting at times so this is my uh new cathedral so would anyone else like to have a little explanation of their work before we we should be wrapping up relatively shortly and I'll give I'll give Debs the last word. Well thank you very much everyone who's spoken tonight about their work. Thank you for the tour Catherine. And um it this exhibition goes on till January, is that right? Sixth of January. 
6th of January. So everyone has plenty of time to go in and have a really good look around. I mean, there's so much to see and it's beautifully presented. Thank you so much to the three curators. This really is um, a very thought provoking as well as very beautiful exhibition. Um, so thank you. And thank you everyone for coming this evening. Um, do tell your friends. Uh, they can look at it, you know, two o'clock in the morning. They can go in and have a look at an art exhibition. What more could they want? Um, and really get it out there so that we can. Um, I think this is a really important exhibition as well as a really beautiful one. So I think it's quite important to get out there. And um, yeah, and well done, everyone. I think it's brilliant. So thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> and um, like I said, we will be listing the speaker so do please join us for that and uh thank you yeah, very and, much. and and i'll just dip back in because uh, i've been wandering through um, some uh, bad signals where i am at the moment um, <laughs> the, the, the speakers will be really interesting um I, I, I may have missed something that you've just said catherine and hannah but um just saying to everyone on, on the 22nd and the 29th they really are good and worth listening to, I think. So the, I think an integral part of the show, really, um, just towards the end of this month. So that's all. There's a quick recording of all the, uh, of all the lovely comments that people have made. There we go. And of course, if you would like to become a friend of ArtCam, the link will be, is in the chat. And we, we, we love being part of our camp. Many of us have been here for quite a long time. Um, and we'll be choosing, choosing some new people joining very shortly as well. As I think we have applications now twice a year, isn't it? Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. And um, if I knew how to stop recording, I would. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Save the recording before closing. I should, I should, shouldn't I? Where is it? Where is the button? Oh, uh, dear. Just, uh, just press the record button, I think. Uh, where is it? I can't find it. This is terrible. Hey. This is, this is <laughs> where I show that my, I'm not as savvy as I think I am. Oh, I dear. Like dear. Well, then, where is yeah. it? But see, mine has all gone to the top. That's the sneaky thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh. All moved. There we go. Pause. Stop recording. Excellent.